Hi, welcome back to The Few Show. My name is Bud. I am an account executive here at uh, Xfusion.io and co-host of The Few Show. I'm excited to be joined today by my guest, Martin Dunn. Martin is a serial entrepreneur spanning three continents and 25 years. Martin is the co-founder of GAIN, the next generation master data management platform specializing in healthcare and life sciences. He's specializing in enterprise data management, including co-founding Delos Technology, which became Cyperion and now is now owned by Informatica and recognized as a leading enterprise MDM platform globally. Sorry, stumbled over myself a little bit there, Martin. How you doing, buddy? Nice to, nice to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks, bud, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure. So before we get into gain and start talking about, about that, I kind of want to talk about your journey a little bit and uh, kind of where you came from and, and how you ended up where you are. So you were born in the UK and... Uh, kind of brought up in, in schools in, in South Africa. So let's let's start there and and figure out how you came to be in California and and uh, you know how you came to be in game. So let's let's start at the beginning. I think that's a good place to start. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, because I have an accent, um, an, an indescribable accent uh, to be honest, but I get asked the question all the time, you know, where are you from? And the the answer can be very long winded, um, uh, or it can be very short. But I live in California, so I'm going to kind of give you the pricey version. Um, started off in the UK, lived there until till I was eight years old. Um, that was in the you know, yeah, kind of born in the '60s, grew up there in the '70s as a child. And UK was not in a good space. Um, the economic depression. The area that we lived in, up in the north of the country, was was particularly hard hit. And I think my parents just wanted to, to, to get us out. My uncle uh, had moved out to South Africa many years before. He was uh, managing the, uh, the largest soccer team in the country, a site called Kaiser Chiefs, and literally living this kind of land of, of milk and honey. Um, and talked my parents into coming on out. And they did. They dragged us out there. And... You know, from eight through eighteen, when I finished high school, uh, that's that's where we lived, and it was it was a really interesting time to be there. We arrived in 1976. The Soweto riots happened literally within two weeks of us arriving. My parents, you could see, looking back on it, were thinking, "What have we done?" Uh, right. We were somewhat oblivious to what was going on as as children uh, in South Africa as we kind of came through high school and became more aware most socially aware of what was going on, you know, so we were out and uh, joining in the protests in the streets and, and doing our thing. But uh, at 18, I, I left high school, left South Africa with a bag of my own, went to the UK um, to go and try and make it in the, the world of professional soccer. Um, uh, a couple of years there, finding it really difficult to, to make the breakthrough. And in order to supplement my poultry income, um, uh, ended up, and I'd, I'd, I'd been at school, at, at high school in South Africa, I, I'd, I'd figured out how to write computer games, and I was making a whole ton of money um, out earning my, my parents by the time I was 16, writing really straightforward computer games. So I kind of self-taught myself this, um, got a job in the UK at an insurance company because I knew computers and because I needed something to do. And the first thing they assigned me to was looking after a big data warehouse project um, and, and that kind of gave me some insights into how poorly uh, business people could explain what they needed and how poorly technology people could deliver it to them. Um, went back to South Africa uh, in my early 20s, um, tail between my leg, having not uh, made any inroads into uh, professional soccer in the UK um, and, and ended up playing in the national leagues in South Africa for several years where once again, using soccer as, as the backdrop, got a job selling uh, data management software for uh, an American company and taught me more about how people were trying to consume technology to solve a business problem. Um, and all of these are kind of foundational thoughts that, that, that are building up. Um, by the time I was uh, 30, and gotten together with with my now the co-founder here at, at Gain, a guy called Jean Paquet. Jean and I have been in business together as 
50-50 partners for more than 25 years. And, and that's a pretty unique relationship and, you know, to deal with through all of the trials and tribulations of building multiple businesses. Um, extremely smart technologist. Um, I'm more on the commercial side. And we ended up putting a company together to go and solve how to take data from a data provider and, and put it into commercial organizations in a more surgical fashion. That company went through various iterations. It was in the dot-com era. And it was just difficult to get anyone to take you seriously if you went something dot com. I mean, we even considered um, back in the day, the, the company at the time was called AMJ Business Solutions. Um, um, there's a funny story about why that name is it, it kind of cropped up and, and how it kind of works out. But AMJ was, was the thing. We thought about, you know, let's call it AMJ.com. And then people would take us more seriously. Um, but we built out the technology, built out a good customer base, and then started looking for uh, venture financing um, for it. It was at the tail end of dot-com. So it was difficult to get heard anyway. And then you can imagine where the VCs had piles of paper on their desks a mile high. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to cut it down to the few that they're gonna dive into more detail on. Uh, trying to get funded trying to get an African software company, because that's the way it was seen. You know, you guys are from where? Right. Africa? Yeah, not for us. And they pass, pass, pass. We ended up getting um, uh, financing from um, some ex-South African uh, business guys that, that happened to be based in Toronto. So we think to ourselves, well, that's, that's real close to America. <laughs> <laughs> That's and this is the only option we've got, right? So let's go and do that. So we ended up pulling a few people over from South Africa to uh, Toronto, spent a couple of years there, and that's where Delos Technology came about. Um, arguably the first enterprise master data management software company. Um, we didn't even know it was gonna be called master data management in, in those days. Nobody had coined the term um, so we were out there evangelizing why companies should follow the example of an Englishman, an American from Africa, who's got a new piece of software, it's going to change your life. And that was two, that was, we moved the company over at the beginning of 2001. Um, and at this stage, when people ask me where I'm from, I'd say I'm from the FBE, uh, the former British Empire. So I ticked off, you know, the UK and South Africa and Canada, and now here I am in the States. Um, and my, my sister's covered off Australia. So that's kind of the way we roll. Um, so we, we, we put the company together in 2000 um, and we were actually on a launch party on a boat in Hudson Bay when the planes hit the towers, uh, September 11. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, having deployed all the capital, having put in your sales team in place and such, um, having got a distinct plan as how you're going to raise your next round of financing. Of course, nothing happened for 18 months. Uh, we lost control of the board, ended up the best way to save the technology because we had this really successful technology. There was a company out in California that had a technology that wasn't going anywhere, but they had plenty of money left in the bank. And that was Siberia. We merged the two together um, and it you know, continued this journey we began. The lesson that we picked up and I mentioned some of this because it ties back to why healthcare for gain. When we'd been launching the company and talking to, to organizations, it wasn't based around a particular vertical. We were looking at all sorts of different use cases for people that kind of would get it. After September 11, you going into 2002, very few people spent any money. They kind of, we don't know what's happening. It's, you know, we're just going to we put all of our budgets on hold. We're going to kind of wait and see whether this is Armageddon or not. Once you miss that budget cycle at the end of 2001, 2002 was a very quiet year. But one of the industries that continued to move forward was life sciences. So the drug manufacturers really were fairly unfazed. They were undented by the, the slowdown and we ended up, we'd sold to, I think, Lilly, then Roche, then Bristol Myers. And over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we sold that platform to uh, eight of the top 10 farmers in the United States and eventually went on and, and gobbled up most of the, the, the big European guys. 
And the lesson that we took away from that was you're looking for, if you're looking for an industry which to, in which to build a beachhead, you look for something that's reasonably recession-proof, um, where there are very distinct use cases that you can build, and then you, in this crossing the chasm type of mentality, you can build what you need to for that industry. And that's that lesson has followed us through to you know where, where we are with gain and you know healthcare. We thought there was just such fantastic huge opportunities to to improve the healthcare system, to strip cost out of the healthcare system. I and mean, we, we still have a system that uses the fix similar fax machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I barely remember using a fax machine. Never mind, you know, some of the people that, that, that we deal with. So it, it's such a large industry. There are so many opportunities to, to add value that we just thought it ticked all the boxes. And we made the choice a, a few years ago to, to take the technology that we built and to focus it on this particular industry. Um, moved down from Canada uh, down to the United States, commuted backwards and forwards between the US and South Africa for, for some time. I have two older boys that uh, were, were in the States with me, went back to South Africa and now back here happily in the States with me. So um, I, I did a lot of flying. Um, I did the US to South Africa journey more than 70 times. That's seven zero. Oh, wow. Not 35 there, 35 back. <laughs> 70 there, that's, 70 back. Uh, that's crazy. An exhausting few years until we reached the point where the, the older boys were kind of finished with high school, ready to come to the States. And that's what we did. Um, I'd also had two new twins, and the twins are now 10. And we really wanted to bring them and have them educated here in the US. And we live in this beautiful spot called San Luis Obispo on the central coast. Um, it's a fantastic place to, for children to grow up. Um, somewhat sheltered, but uh, growing and interesting enough to, you know, for us to, to make a home here. So but that's been the journey of, of how we've arrived at this point. That's, that's fascinating. I, I love I love talking to founders and, and figure out why they chose the field that they're in. And, and there's... Yeah, I think in a lot of cases, it picks you rather than you picking it. And yeah. that, that's kind of a classic example. We followed our nose. And the problem that, that I walked into on day one of my, you know, my first ever real job with this insurance company in the UK still remains the problem that we're solving today. And, and, you know, it's essentially that business people express what they need in very um, ambiguous terms. Um, sometimes they ask for things that can't be done. Sometimes they've read a, a magazine article about artificial intelligence or blockchain or whatever the shiny new object is. And they'll, you know, come to you with, some, you know, some unrealistic notion. And then on the other side of it, you've got the, you know, the technology people that, that know what is possible, but they're aimed at the wrong thing. And th that's, that has been an issue. And it's something that we, you know, we, I, I'm sure will be an issue long after I'm done. Um, but we've definitely made a lot of inroads into helping the interconnectivity of, of business systems, business people, and business process. Yeah. I just got finished uh, before you came on. Just got finished reading your 2018 article uh, about the shiny new things yes. uh, that you put on <laughs> that you put on uh, LinkedIn there, um, and, and how people want to follow the shiny new things, but but they don't think about the uh, the foundation and, and how the foundation is going to be, you know, about how the foundation is set for the for the shiny new object like the 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 AI or the blockchain and and how you're setting the foundation really before you go out and 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 give the you set the foundation with gain before you go out and give that to the people um so i i, I like how you're doing that as well um, so let's, let's go ahead. Well, first of all, I want to ask, so you were, 
you were trying to become a professional soccer player. You have four children. Any of them play soccer? Yeah, my uh, my twenty two year old, um, is a very very good player. Um, yeah, he he was he was at one stage recognized as is as one of the top talents in in the country in South Africa. He's playing at the academy programs and all the rest of it, playing for some coaches that I actually played under and with. And then one day, out of the blue, decides, Dad, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going skating, and he takes up downhill longboarding. They fly down these hills at 70 miles an hour. I'm thinking, oh, my God. And within a year, had got himself to number one in the country at that little endeavor. Wow. And, you know, there's pictures of, of my son. He's holding up, you know, trophies and things under the Red Bull signs and bunches of 15- and 16-year-old girls along at the events. And I kind of nodded along to him and said, yeah, I get why you uh, ditched the soccer. Um, <laughs> But I think you'll come back. And the, the two little ones, they, they, they both play. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just finishing up a season of coaching another couple of teams. Um, so it, it's a lot of fun. Um, it, it's, it, it's a lifelong passion. I'm, I still play myself. And uh, it, it, the, the friends that I've made over the years, the sides that I've played for over the years, having moved around a lot, it was always very simple to move into a new place. I'd turn up in a new town, a new place, Turn up at the local soccer club because I kind of know which way to lace my boots. I was I was on. I have thirty friends, and it I, I try to instill that in, in the kids as well that you know it, it's going to open a lot of doors for you throughout your life. Yeah, my my pastor he grew up playing soccer. He grew up in uh, Southern California. He grew up playing soccer. He just absolutely loves soccer. I live in nowhere, Colorado, up in Northeast Colorado, where soccer is not a big thing. So. He he came out here about ten years ago, and uh, immediately started coaching the soccer team. and And he's he's like, man, there's just not a lot of soccer out here. But he, <laughs> he got involved, you know. But he's he's the same way. Like anything, anything that has to do with soccer, he's you know he's all about. But um, <clears throat> but back back to business here. Um, let let's go ahead and talk about gain a little bit. Uh, let's let's go ahead and talk about what it is. Um, we, we kind of talked about why you started it, but let's go into what you do and, and just really why you do what you do. Sure. So the, if, if we kind of think about from a vision perspective, um, we're, our vision is to remove as much of the needless administrative waste from the healthcare industry as we can on the basis that if we do that, those dollars flow through to care. They flow through to better outcomes for, for patients. And there's an incredible amount of, of wastage in, in healthcare. A lot of weaking, a lot of vaccine, and a lot of phone calls in order to accomplish really straightforward things. Uh, so that both is the, you know, the white space, the business opportunity, um, as well as the the driving force behind what we do. This is the first time in in my career that we've that I've been able to get out of bed in the morning and think what I do today has a positive impact on the world, as opposed to what I do today will earn us some money for some random project in transportation or oil and gas or all the other places that that, that we've been. So we accomplish that by by enabling the interchange of information between systems that wouldn't necessarily speak to each other. And if you break that down, it gets all the way back to the core learning that, that I had on, on day one in this industry. As people think in terms of plugging two systems together as, as a map between one and the other, you've got name in two fields and I wanna put it in one field over here. Uh, you know, that's, that's straightforward. But we've been able to do that for more than 30 years, and we still don't have real interoperability, exchange of information between systems. And that's because of the context that, that people have that, that actually create and manage this, this data. Whereas one person uses a particular field of you know, provider type for, for one purpose, and they have their own classifications, the, per, the organization they're trying to exchange the information with has uses that field differently. 
um, with a whole bunch of different concepts at a different level of granularity. And these two are trying to exchange a simple file. You can't do that just by mapping provider type to provider type and saying, I want to send you over my data. So you have to have this, this localization that allows people to understand information in the context that they have and then put information using the context that they have back into this intelligent switch, this intelligent exchange, so that it can then be translated and, and given to someone else so they can use it. And it's a massive problem. And it, it's complicated by people. You know, they, they say, my, an old soccer coach of mine used to say, soccer is a simple game played by complicated players. Life is a simple game pay, played by complicated people. This business that we do, it's a simple solution complicated by people that have their own agendas, they have their own budgets, they have their own priorities, they have their own regulatory concerns. And all of these things need to be factored into how you, you make this exchange. And, and our company has built platforms that allow us to solve those localizations, put it into a canonical and exchangeable format, and then retranslate it for the consumer. And that doesn't mean one one letter, one set of customizations for each single client. Any one organization that we're exchanging information with may have 10 or 12 different contexts that they need to see the data in. And that's what makes it, that's what makes it uh, difficult to solve. That's why you need particular technology for it. And, you know, to, to the whole point about the shiny new objects, we're really boring plumbing. <laughs> when we do our job, you don't see what we do. Um, and right. it, it makes it difficult because people are drawn to this thing. Oh, look at this thing that I can see and I can touch, but it will only work. Any of these apps uh, or any of these business processes that people are trying to put in place will only work if you give them the right information. And very few people exist in isolation. Uh, we all live in a complex ecosystem. So even if you manage to sort out your own internal data management, you as a business, particularly in healthcare, need to coordinate with other healthcare companies that are at a different level of maturity, a different level of sophistication, have different standards, have different technology capabilities. And unless the whole thing has an exchange of information, it, it breaks down and, and we end up you know, at the, the weakest point in the chain, at some point, the information doesn't flow. And Dr. Jones is going to have to send a fax over to Dr. Smith, who's going to type it in. And we haven't, you know, the problem isn't solved unless the chain is complete. Uh, so we, we provide a, a we, we provide the technology um, in order to, to solve for some of these issues. And we've spent the last few years dialing it into the very specific health care cases that the healthcare use cases um, that now allows us to walk into a provider organization, a payer, a life sciences company, and just plug, map their internal systems into our software to understand their policies, to map those policies in, and then to be able to trans, uh, transport that out to other consumers. And it's been many years in, in the building. And, and the team that we have here, you know, 20 years ago, we built what is now the Informatica uh, MDM platform, highly respected, but it's a horizontal platform. It can go into any industry and it's highly configurable. Uh, I think that the industry is changing um, from those mm -hmm. one platform does everything as long as you bring in a big five consulting firm, have multiple years to spend and many millions of dollars. We've moved to a much more of a focused use case model that says, here's the problem that I particularly have, here's how I want to solve it. Cloud-based applications make that easier because there's less infrastructure you need to put down. And that journey that we've been on, we've spent almost 10 years building the technology that GAIN has. And we still have another 10 years worth of, of stuff to do um, just at that plumbing level. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's fascinating um, and can be frustrating at times when people rush out and, and buy an application or try to get into a line of business without having put down the uh, the infrastructure for it. And we often are brought in after the fact to say, uh, we tried this and it failed. So what can you do for me? Um, 
and you know the easiest answer is I'd like to rewind time by a couple of years and do it properly from the beginning. But oftentimes we're kind of retrofitting this solution around something that that you know people are already using. Sure. So basically, you're you're taking the new PVC plumbing and and putting it around the old, you know, the old rusty pipe. Yeah. Um, R- ripping out yeah. the lead pipes and putting in the foundation. <laughs> <thing. laughs> a lot of uh, you know, yeah. a lot of nasty stuff that that needs to be uh, addressed. <clears throat> yeah. So when when you're talking, especially with healthcare stuff. And you're talking about the exchange of information. I, I know that that people. And when I first started looking into this, that one of my first things was, ooh, HIPAA, you know, HIPAA compliance. And um, but I, I think what you're more talking about is the exchange of information. Um, well, let's let me kind of rewind just a little bit. So with the new like no surprises act right mm-hmm. let's let's just kind of go let's just kind of go with that I, I didn't even know anything about this until i started looking in into this show um i had no idea that the, the there was 2.1 to 2.3 billion dollars a year spent just on databases being updated just to try and get databases updated on provider information. Um, just, just to try and get people information that's up to date. That has nothing to do with HIPAA. That just has to do with information going out to people to, so that they can get proper information on who's in their plan and who they can go to, um, you know, what, what drugs they can get on their plan. Uh, what pharmacies they can go to on their plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're spending over $2 billion a year that we have to pay out of our pocket to go to insurance. Yes. What you can do with the proper flow of information is, is cut that down substantially is my guess, right? If I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, and I'm understanding what you're doing, the proper flow of information between providers and between insurance companies should be able to cut that two $2 billion down substantially with the proper flow of information. And um, the, the ease of information to the people, if I'm saying that correctly. Am, am I getting that right? So you, you are, you, you, you're kind of circling around the, the, the topic and, um, you know, allow me to, and, and I think this is you know, Please. really interesting because, you know, you, you're coming into this and so we've exchanged a little bit of information, you, you've read a little bit about it to kind of catch yourself up and then you right. know, it's like, wow, can you believe it? And that's part of the problem is that the people that understand these problems absolutely wake up every day thinking about them and dealing with the antiquated way we we've gone about as an industry dealing with it but those who don't who are not the the majority of people are not aware of the problem um uh, until they go to their health plan and try and make an appointment with you know a podiatrist or a dermatologist or something and they find out that the first 10 numbers they phoned just rang off the hook and the next guy they got, I said, I'm not taking any more patients. And the next guy says, I'll take you next November. That is a challenge for us in healthcare. And there's a whole slew of, of other topics that are related to why it's, why it's a challenge and, and such, which kind of beyond the scope of this conversation, but to kind of put it back into, to, to context where we believe the, the value to the industry is, is by ensuring that consumers understand the product they're buying and have access to that product and that the regulators who are responsible for making sure that networks are adequate. There are enough primary care physicians and dermatologists and such in your network to, to sustain your population. All of these things come down to having accurate data. And when you consider the way 
uh, so we live here in California, which is the most complex healthcare market of any kind anywhere in the world. It's the largest, most complex single market anywhere in the world. If there is something we could do to complicate things, we've managed to do it at some point over the past few decades. <laughs> um, and, and our software runs um, an initiative called the Symphony Provider Directory here in, in California, which links multiple health plans and multiple provider groups. We got into that uh, a number of years ago when a guy called Bill Barcelona from America's Physician Groups, and they're a trade organization representing physicians. We were talking to him about adding social determined data to members to, to manage risk and that type of thing. And he said, that's great. He said, but let me stop you right there. Here's a problem that my members, and they represent provider groups all over the country. Here's a problem my members are going to have. The rate at which we need to update the provider directory data with the health plans is increasing. And that's going to mean my providers are going to get more faxes from more health plans more frequently. And it's going to, they won't have the resources to do it. And I said, well, that's crazy. Not only that, here's something I'll tell you. The more you reach out to these people with different mechanisms to collect the data, the more interactions you have with them, the worse the data quality is going to get. So what do you mean? So, well, it's not the doctor that's filling out these forms. It's whoever's on the front desk on that day. Some of these people haven't been there long, and they don't understand the contracting mechanisms by which you uh, are, are attached to these different health plans. So take a typical California doctor who's cut, is contracted with eight different health plans. He may hold a direct PPO contract with, with Anthem through his small practice of him and three other doctors. And then that small practice contracts with uh, an IPA, uh, Independent Physicians Organiz uh, Association. And that IPA contracts with a different health plan for an HMO product, for a managed care product. And then that IPA joins an MSO managed services organization that then contracts with a third health plan for that IPA. And that health plan rents that network to a fourth health plan. When the consumer goes to say, can I go and see Dr. Smith? The provider directory is now a very difficult tool because if you phone direct Dr. Smith's office and you say, is Dr. Smith there at that location every Wednesday? Yes. But that doesn't solve the problem as to whether he's contracted for the, even the health plan that you're dealing with, never mind the products that they've got. Every health plan breaks its networks down differently. So whereas, and we were looking at this case the other day in, uh, for a particular problem that we were helping someone solve, and we were looking at Stanford Medical Group. Well, Stanford Medical Group obviously is a, it, it's a complex system with hospitals as, as well as various different clinics and multiple different doctors that, that work within the system. And they contract with the different health plans. The health plans break Stanford down into acute care hospitals, behavioral health, independent doctors, all, all sorts of different categories. That's not the way Stanford see their business. That's the way the health plan sees their business. So the notion that, that Stanford could send an updated file to a dozen different health plans in the format that each one of those plans wants in a way that the health plan could just blindly absorb it into their systems and update them in order to meet. Now, surprise billing says a change to your provider network needs to be updated in two days. You think about the velocity of change that's, that's going on out there, the different people that need to be notified about it and the complexity of the contracting arrangement. That's why the problem's uh, challenging. So what we've been doing is, is working on a way that we can normalize the context, the way someone like a Stanford sees its business with the way one of its contracted health plans sees its business. And then to provide both of them with the flexibility they need so they can continue with their existing systems, but still exchange information. And it's been a, a long, difficult journey. Um, the, yeah, I bet. The, the, there's a 501c organization, um, Integrated Healthcare Association, that, that are the governance body that manage the entire program. We're the technology hands and feet uh, that, that, that go into that. 
This is a program we started as a commercial venture in 2016 and signed a bunch of plans and groups up to it. But it's difficult for a commercial organization to go and solve these challenges. Uh, it's better done with a multi-stakeholder uh, group. And that's what uh, IHA um, were, were able to do. It's also something that to do it at this kind of scale required some funding and that, that came through the, the regulator um, in terms of some seed funding to stand the program up. And still with multi-stakeholder groups, with governance meetings, with policy groups sitting and, and discussing how they want to handle, um, you know, everything from, you know, how many values do we want to have in the gender field? Because that's a pretty fluid, if you pardon the pun, it's a pretty fluid concept at the moment. Um, so as these standards are developed um, with this multi-stakeholder group, which is itself a massive undertaking, so then the technology needs to be able to support it. But that's what it takes. And the benefits, there's actually a short-term investment required in order to get through to the benefits because you get to this weakest point in the chain. So if I've got a group that's connected to a plan, but that plan can't yet absorb the data in an automated fashion, even though everyone's got investment to lay down the foundations, they're not seeing the benefit or not seeing the full benefit of that as it comes out the far end. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have in healthcare is that the, the, the initiatives that are in place that are gonna move the needle take multiple years. And they take a long time just because there's so much legacy debt that, that exists within the system. Um, and, and it's impractical to expect that everybody can update all of their systems and processes quickly, efficiently, and, and to a particular deadline. Um, the, the, the way the regulations are written are, are often very disconnected from reality in terms of how you can roll these programs out. Um, and, you know, that's the world yeah. that we've chosen to live in. Um, uh, you know, it, it's certainly challenging and that, that's a good thing. Um, but it, it can also be a little frustrating at times. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can see that. That's that little, that little snippet that you just said opens up a, a lot of, opens my eyes quite a bit. Like I, there, there's a lot to, to crack into there. Um, well, I, I wish we had a lot more time today to be able to get into it. Uh, yeah. unfortunately we don't, but, um, go ahead. You were going to say something. I, say, I think the, the, the surprise billing it is, is one of the kind of initiatives that I, I think potentially starts to move things forward at, at more of a pace because there's a very real tangible, um, you know, you, you, you deal with carrots and sticks all the time, right? You dangle the carrot, mm -hmm. but sometimes you need the stick just to move things along. Um, the surprise billing is, has got that, that kind of um, stick penalty built into it. Whereas if, if you can show that the, the, the information that you relied upon when you made your decision around the doctor, the clinic, the hospital, or whatever, should have been in network at a particular price point, and it's not, the health plan is going to be responsible for covering those costs, you know, at, at those network rates. So there's very real dollars and a lot of very real dollars that are attached to it. Now, how practical it is to start to roll that out. Um, I think it would be a mistake to roll it out overnight and say, okay, every time there's a mistake, we're going to start finding people, you know, thousands of dollars per, per incident. But it's definitely, it, it's definitely, um, given a little, little bit more momentum to some of the investments that need to be made in order to solve the problem. Once the problem solved, the, the benefits of that will accrue for many, many years, and um, both to the commercial health plans, both to the ultimate payer, which in oftentimes is the government, um, and to the consumer who has better access to care and better understanding of, of what they're paying for. So there's, you know, it's a win-win-win once you get through some of the, uh, the initial hurdles. And that's, you know, that, that's the fight that, that we fight every day. Yeah, that is. Um, I mean, in reality, now that, now that this is kind of rolling, how long do you think before, before we get to a point where, where this is a reality that, that we're, 
that were kind of over the edge and, and were to that point where, I mean, this is kind of fixed, you could say. Yeah. Um, I think in, in terms of healthcare, just given the size and shape of, of our healthcare system, which is by design, um, very dis- highly distributed, um, it, it, you would think of it in terms of decades rather than years. Um, in fact, I was reading a paper that CMS just put out, kind of a re- revision of a paper of a ten-year, a ten-year vision for interoperability, um, and it, it's really kind of talking around health information exchanges and, and passing clinical data between you know different endpoints. And that's a market that we stayed out of. We don't deal with the clinical information. Uh, we think that it's it, you know it, it's a different space. It's got its own challenges and we're kind of adjacent to it. But they just released this paper, this 10-year vision. But we're already 10 years into that journey. Um, you know, <laughs> the, the government has invested billions of dollars in getting people to put electronic medical record systems into their organizations, into standing up health information exchanges. Um, but that was just kind of getting a few pieces on the board. Now getting them to play together as a team and to interoperate and, and to solve some of the, the more intractable uh, problems of uh, clinical data sharing, such as, you know, hospitals are a little like hotels. Uh, they make money when there are heads in beds. I'm yeah. a large hospital. I've got all this patient data. I think of those as my customers. You know, the, 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 the incentive then to share that information with my competitor down the road is not entirely there. Um, so that there are many, many challenges. Uh, we, we have health information exchange works well when there is a small community of uh, HIEs that talk to each other. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, so putting information into a common place you know, only adds value if we know where that common place is. It can't be a common place if I've got 10 of them. <laughs> I've still got to go much right. around right. Where, my, where my records are. So I, I think that these things just take they, they take a lot of time. And every time you touch a system in healthcare, uh, because of the security protocols, because of HIPAA, because of high trust, because of yeah, these other uh, data privacy concerns, everything takes time and, and is expensive. And that's just the reality uh, of our system. I do believe that as you look forward, any one of these things measured over you know, a five to 10 year period gives you a, a substantial payback. Uh, but you have to make those investments up front uh, in order to get there. Yeah. Man. Well, I really wish I could keep talking to you and and ask a lot more questions because I have a lot more questions running through my head. But unfortunately, I have a hard stop um, that, that I have to get going. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really apologize about that. But, uh, I don't know, maybe I can have you back on for another show sometime and and we can can figure some of this stuff out. (laughs) But, uh, (laughs) um, there, I think there's a lot more information that we could go into on this. And and, and I think there's a lot more, there's a lot more to you that, that we could probably, uh, go, go into as well. Um, I think there's a lot of your story that we, that we probably didn't hit, but, uh, having said that, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna have to land this plane, and and the way that I do that on this show is is I ask two questions to everybody that's on this show, um, and these two questions, and this one I'm kind of looking forward to because you've you've been in this game for a long time, uh, you've been a founder since uh, you know really before the internet, before cell phones, and and now you're in it now. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I am sorry about that. <laughs> But what advice would you give to founders or soon to be founders that are going to be watching this program? I, I, the best book that I ever read uh, in, in this regard was, was Crossing the Chasm. Um, the, this notion that, you know, find something that you can be the best at and go and do that and just, just do that until it's a solid beachhead for you. Um, and, and that's, that, that's, Whenever we've strayed from that path, it's, it's bitten us in the backside. 
And whenever we've stuck to that path, it's worked out well. So I, I just encourage people to kind of think that way. Cool. And then the last one is what is the best way for our viewers to get in touch with you if they so choose? So gain.com, G-A-I-N-E.com. Um, there's some, there's some blog postings there under the insights section and some white papers and, you know, some of the stuff we've been talking about today has been, you know, written down and prettied up. Um, and there's a contact us page there, um, or, you know, feel free to reach out directly to me. Um, you know, martin.dunn at gain.com. Um, you know, happy right. to, to, to dive into conversations and, um, you know, wax lyrical about this topic. Yeah. And, and there is so much information on, on gain.com. Um, we didn't get into really hardly any of it. Um, there, there's a lot of information. So go there, uh, check it out. And, uh, Martin, I, I just, I really appreciate you being on and I wish we could have spent a little more time. Uh, again, I apologize about that, but thank you for being on the show today. Yeah. Thanks. But thank, thanks for having me.